So a very good afternoon to everybody present here. We are live from Hall B, and without any ado, let's get started. It is a lecture on the management on diabetes, and our first lecture will be delivered by Dr. Nitin Verma. Over to you, sir. Well, uh, th thank you, thank you for uh, inviting us to be part of your uh, your congress. I know we are on the last day, but I trust that your congress has gone on well. Uh, this is a RANSCO session. So this is a session that is uh, jointly populated by people from the Royal Australia and New Zealand College of Ophthalmologists, as well as the All India Ophthalmic Society. The links between RANSCO and AIOS uh, go a long way. And uh, uh, and I think they get, they get, they've been getting stronger uh, as the years go by and COVID has uh, not been able to shake this uh, association. And I think uh, it's just getting just getting better. I uh, am pleased to see that you are all coming out of the uh, wave, but I, I I suspect that we are getting into one now here in in, in Australia. So, uh, but you know, as usual, we we have a lot to learn from each other, and um, I'm pleased to uh, to note that the breadth of speakers are from uh, Tasmania, where I am at the bottom of Australia, to WA, and then on to uh, uh, to Coimbatore in India, so you know you're spanning half the globe. Uh, if you if you were to measure how far uh, we are apart, but uh, we're we're together, we're going to talk about uh, about uh, you know the the modern management of diabetic retinopathy, uh, and I'll introduce the the speaker and the topic as we start. But basically, over the years, we uh, you know we made a lot of progress in the management of diabetic retinopathy, and I'm sure all of you. I remember the days when uh, we had uh, no treatment and then when treatment was there, uh, the treatment was slightly better than the natural history of the disease. Uh, and then we now got into the state where we are looking at not only uh, saving uh, or stopping the decline, but actually restoring vision. So the advantages uh, of uh, technology have really been put into the, into the field of diabetic eye disease. Uh, the advent of uh, intravitreal um, anti-VEGFs, the advent of better lasers, the uh, better intravitreal steroids, and of course, surgical techniques have gone a long way. But I think world over, we are, we are stuck with one major issue, and that is uh, catching the disease early, because the, uh, the, if you catch something early, so you get early diagnosis, you get prompt uh, treatment, you get a better outcome. And that is a universal truth, and I think we're all struggling with that. But that aside, I think we uh, might get on to uh, today's talk on, uh, on diabetic retinopathy. And to start with, I'd like to uh, invite Professor Hesam Razavi, my colleague from WA, who's going to talk about the management of uh, diabetic macular edema in the indigenous population in Australia. And I let, uh, so we, we, we're going to have uh, 15 to 18 minutes talks each, and we might uh, reserve the questions for the end because we'll have plenty of time for that. And so if the audience would like to send in uh, their messages uh, through the chat box, that might be that might be easier. But uh, any anyway, here we are. Over to you, Hesam. Thank you so much, um, Prof Verma, and uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Vignesh Raja and uh, Associate Professor Bala, who are on the call. My colleagues here in Australia, as well as my colleagues over in India. Obviously, thank you for your attendance. So I will attempt to share my screen, if you bear with me. And uh, we will start at the start. Uh, can everybody see the introductory slide? Yes, sir. Okay, so guys, today I'll be summarizing a study that we did here in, w in WA in Western Australia over a two year period. This is the first uh, ophthalmic randomized clinical trial to look at the treatment of diabetic uh, macular edema, specifically in the Australian Aboriginal patient subgroup, okay? So obviously lots of research has been done on diabetic macular edema in various other patient groups all around the world for quite some time now, but there had never been a study looking specifically at the Aboriginal population. And this is a group of patients that many of us treat, um, see and treat uh, quite a lot here in Western Australia. So we thought that it would be useful and appropriate to try and conduct a study looking just at these patients. So this is what I'll be summarizing for you today. 
Um, the, it was an investigator initiated study, which was sponsored by Allegan, but there were no conflicts of interests and the sponsor had no role in the design of the study. The background is that the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema are higher in Aboriginal people in Australia compared to non-Aboriginal people. So if you look at the top uh, row there, the top bar, it will show you that the prevalence of diabetes itself, type one and type two, is almost triple uh, that in Aboriginal people compared to non-Aboriginal people. And there are many reasons for this. Vision loss from diabetic retinopathy, uh, again, it, uh, it's more than triple um, in Aboriginal compared to non-Aboriginal non people. And not surprisingly, most of that vision loss is from uh, diabetic macular edema. The uh, uh, image that we've got down the bottom there is, try is trying to show that there's a balance between uh, the number of injections that are needed to adequately treat someone with DME versus the duration of action of the drug. So what I'm saying there is if you've got uh, a drug that lasts a month, you're going to need more injections, longer duration of action, you're going to need fewer injections. And I'll explain why that's important to this group. Basically, in the outback setting where a lot of Aboriginal people live, not all of them, but a lot do, the drugs that the drug that traditionally we've had available to us is Avastin or Bevacizumab. This is because it's uh, easy to acquire and uh, it's easy to, to transport to a district hospital. We don't need any special application for it. And you can have a consignment stock kept almost in any clinic in the state of this drug. And, and traditionally, this is what we've used. Uh, however, the longer acting drugs have been available and several years ago now, the intravitreal dexamethasone implant came out uh, where the duration of action was shown to be three months up to six months. And there are some side effects with dexamethasone, but we thought that this would be a useful drug to compare to bevacizumab uh, in this particular patient subgroup because they would not need as many injections. And the lack of attendance and the difficulty in um, treating people, say, eight to 10 times a year, which is really what they need with anti vegf at least in the first year, we thought perhaps there's an opportunity here to get around that by using a longer acting intravitreal steroid implant. So what were our methods? Uh, this was a prospective phase four multicenter randomized active controlled non-inferiority trial. So we were hoping to demonstrate, um, well, the question we were really asking was, is dexamethasone at least not inferior to Avastin? Perhaps it's superior, but we would, uh, we're asking the question of whether it's not inferior. So in, in two years, we were able to enroll 63 eyes from 51 participants, and we got the local ethics, ethics approval as well, of course. And the patients were recruited from all over the state. Um, some were recruited from Perth, the state capital itself. But as you can see from the image there, uh, patients came from all over the state as far as 3,000 kilometers away from the capital in Perth. What was the intervention? Well, as I've said, it's the dexamethasone implant versus bevacizumab, and it was a one-to-one -one randomization. The study design was that we'll attempt to see every patient in this trial every month, whether they get an injection or not. Now, in the case of Avastin, at every visit, we're going to inject them. Uh, that's the intention. So we're aiming for 12 injections a year, knowing that we're very likely not going to achieve that, but, this, uh, but that was our intention. And with dexamethasone, we're aiming for four injections a year, so one injection every three months, uh, and, uh, but with monthly review so that intraoc depression and cataract formation could be uh, assessed. And then laser and other surgery uh, could be performed as needed. The primary outcome was that we were looking at the upper bound of the 90% confidence interval of the difference in effect between the two interventions. Now I'll explain this more a little bit as we go along, but essentially that's the test for non-inferiority. Uh, and we're looking at the difference in vision, the best corrective vision from baseline to 12 months between these two treatment arms and the non-inferiority margin was 0.1 logma uh, between the two groups. Um, 
So what were our results? Well, here's the, the consort diagram. So we started off with 63 eyes, which were eligible. Uh, four were excluded. They didn't actually meet the criteria. The rest were randomized. And then some withdrew uh, and, and uh, others, um, the patient self withdrew themselves. In others, we had um, adverse events. And so we ended up with 26 uh, in the avastin arm and 22 in the dexamethasone arm. And so here's the first result. Uh, the top one, the, the dashed vertical line that you see there is the threshold for non-inferiority. And so, uh, and to the left of the uh, bars is uh, results that favor dexamethasone. And to the right of the image is results that favor bevacizumab. So what the top one shows was that the visual results favored uh, dexamethasone for the whole group overall in a way that did meet non-inferiority. This is for the whole group. So for the whole group, uh, the dexamethasone implant was found to be non-inferior to bevacizumab. The second image, the one that's lower down, shows the results after you control for the effect of cataract surgery performed during the trial. So when we remove the effect of cataract surgery performed during the trial, then you can see that the result just crosses over with the non-inferiority threshold. This means that it approached non-inferiority, but it was not non-inferior. Dexamethasone, after you control for the effect of cataract surgery, was not found to be non-inferior. Uh, now, I'll talk about this more uh, in a moment because in Australia, you actually have to perform cataract surgery in order to, the patient has to be pseudophagic or has to be scheduled for cataract surgery at the time that they're injected with dexamethasone. So in a sense, the top result is more relevant to Australia because you, you have you, you know you have to have done cataract surgery or be doing it soon, uh, but it does raise the question of some settings where it's difficult for a patient to have access to cataract surgery. So let's say you're in the middle of nowhere and you inject someone with dexamethasone, you almost have to have a guarantee if they're phakic that you can get that person to theatre somewhere somehow. And this is one of the challenges of performing outback work. But again, just to reiterate the results of this particular, these are the top line results. Overall, as a group, dexamethasone was found to be non-inferior, um, but after you control for cataract surgery, it just misses out on that non-inferiority threshold. Okay, so here's the change in VA. The orange or, or, or red um, line represents bevacizumab and the, and the dashed turquoise line is dexamethasone. So you can see that at the 12 month mark, these are logma results. The Avastin group, the bevacizumab group actually had worse vision, uh, whereas the dexamethasone group uh, on average had better vision. So overall, at the end of the 12 months, better vision in favor of dexamethasone for the whole group. Here's central macular thickness. So not surprisingly, individual steroids are known to be particularly good for central macular thickness. And so you can see that the, again, the dexamethasone group had a greater mean reduction in central macular thickness after 12 months. Um, now I'll see if I can get this um, to work. So here's the number of attendances. So overall attendances were higher. If you look on the left, this is patients who were seen in Perth, metropolitan setting versus patients seen on the far right hand side um, in a regional setting. And overall attendances were higher in Perth, not surprising, um, easier for city patients to get to a city clinic and also we ophthalmologists um, may only visit a country site six times in a year, whereas we're more likely to be present in the city site every single time. The next one will show you, oh, it's just disappeared. Apologies. Okay, so here's the number of injections. So remember that we were aiming to get four injections of dexamethasone. So in the city, we've pretty much achieved that. In the country, we got two and a half, let's say, to three injections. But as a proportion of the number that we were intending to administer, in the country especially, we got much closer to injecting how many we intended as far as dexamethasone, let's say three out of four, compared to bevacizumab, where we got five out of 12. 
So again, this just shows that this steroid, you're gonna get closer to your intended number of injections per year. In the city, you're pretty much gonna get four. And in a country town, you're gonna to get three, which is not terrible. You compare that to five out of 12 Avastin, you know, five Avastin injections for the average person with DMO, it just isn't gonna be enough. In the city, however, 10, 10 Avastin injections almost, that's a pretty good result. And this just reflects the, the proportion of intended treatments. So again, as you can see, the proportion of intended treatments, good with dexamethasone, but uh, worse with Avastin in country areas. Okay, um, here's the change in vision compared between city patients and country patients. So uh, on the left-hand side, you can see that Avastin was actually uh, better. So in the city where Avastin patients were able to get, receive 10 injections, they end up with a greater improvement in vision. Again, remember this is Logmar vision. In the country, it was the exact opposite. So patients who received dexamethasone got a far better visual result than those that were receiving, being, receiving Avastin. And this was the result that we suspected. And it reflects what I just showed you, which, has, which is that in country patients especially, Dexamethasone patients are getting three out of their four injections. Avastin patients are only getting five out of their 12, five or six. Hence, country patients in particular are benefiting from intravitreal steroids. So the take home points here was that the Dex implant was not non-inferior to Avastin after you adjust for cataract surgery. However, it was non-inferior when you combine with cataract surgery. And uh, what I was, the point I was making earlier was that you have to combine it with cataract surgery in Australia. So for this reason, we think the second result is a more real world result for Australia, as long as you can ensure access to cataract surgery for patients in any location. So if you're thinking about intravitreal dexamethasone, at the same time, you have to be thinking about cataract surgery if they're, if they're not already pseudophagic. Uh, the next point is that uh, there were fewer tendencies required, fewer injections required, and superior clinical outcomes in terms of both vision and central macular thickness among the dexamethasone patients, especially in the regional areas. In the regional areas, it actually surpassed non-inferiority and achieved superiority. A uh, limitation always in Aboriginal healthcare is a lack of attendance. So 50% non-attendance, and this was with an Aboriginal liaison officer that we used, and we had other staff members providing free transport and patient reminders and all this stuff. So in the real world, 50% is actually very good attendance, unfortunately, and real world attendance we have found in our outreach service in Western Australia, it can actually be closer to 20 to 30%. So, so you also have to be very mindful of this, regardless of which drug you use. Um, I'd just like to finish by, by uh, repeating that this is the first ever ophthalmic randomized controlled trial to have exclusively recruited Aboriginal or Indigenous patients anywhere. And the model that we used, the template that we used to, to create the study, we believe, should help future Aboriginal-led research to be carried out in places like Australia, but also Canada, uh, South Africa, the USA, places where there is an Indigenous population within a, a broader non-Indigenous population. I'd like to thank all my collaborators and colleagues on this study. Uh, that's the end of my talk. Thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, yeah. Yes, please. We can proceed with the second speaker. Thank you. Uh, anyway, thanks, Hesam. Uh, it was uh, very enlightening, and I'm sure the messages, the the. Uh, the message that you've sent out would be very useful in different, in many parts of the world. It's not particularly. Uh, uh, people you know. with the questions regarding uh, the first uh, talk. Can I? Big pardon. Can I? Yeah, can we, I ask yeah. You want to ask we, questions last, or you want to? Uh, we'll do the we'll do the question at the end if that's all right. Okay. Would that be okay? Yeah. Uh, I'd now like to invite Dr. Vignesh Raja, who's the head of department uh, at the Sir Charles Gardner Hospital, also in Perth. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, imaging modalities in diabetic retinopathy. Uh, over to you, Vignesh, and uh, thank you for putting all this together. Oh, uh, thank you, Prof. Verma, and uh, thank you, uh, 
Professor Hassan Razavi, Prof. Chandra Bala, and Professor Salvanan for this uh, coming together to make this wonderful lecture. Let me just uh, share my screen very quickly. I would like to thank uh, Chandra for his uh, input with this presentation, and he's given me a lot of this, a lot of these slides for this talk as well. And I, I'm going to be talking about uh, imaging modalities in diabetic retinopathy and the recent advances. So, as we all uh, know, that uh, you know the the common uh, modalities that we use are color fundus photography, uh, OCT, now OCT angiography, and the standard uh, fluorescein angiography. So let me go through each of them and the recent uh, updates in each of these modalities. So color fundus, you know, uh, like we usually most of the diabetic retinopathy screening uh, cameras are all uh, true color. And uh, of course, with the Heidelberg spectralis, we have uh, multicolor or pseudo color. Uh, but the limitation of the color fundus uh, pictures, uh, the limited field of view, they show the, they show things in true color very nicely. And uh, diabetes is usually a posterior pole disease, so you see most of uh, most of the pathology in the posterior pole. But now uh, we uh, there are uh, new advances with ultra wide field imaging like the Optos and the Zeiss uh, Claris. And you know most of the ETDR's classification was largely based on the color photography with with uh, limited uh, resolution. And the disease stratification on the ETDRS was based uh, you know, on the seven standard field of views. But we can see here that you know, most of the peripheral retina is not evaluated. And this is a, a illustrative Optos ultra wide field picture, which shows you about 200 degrees field of view in the horizontal meridian and about 160 to 180 at the, at the top. And you can see peripheral imaging very nicely because all of us know that apart from uh, you know diabetes predominantly is a posterior disease, but we have lots of uh, peripheral pathology as well. And going on to the next modality, uh, OCT. Uh, so OCT is now the mainstay of any retinal practice. You know, as all of us know, it is non-invasive, safe, fast and highly reproducible, and the resolution is now as good as three to six microns. And here is a typical standard OCT, where you can see all the 10 layers of the retina, as, uh, as mentioned uh, you know, in, the in the histology books, and this is where we can see it real time. You know, and this is in, in the histopathology, this is the normal retina on the left, and you can see the diabetic macular edema in the right with cystoid spaces seen in the you know inner nuclear and outer nuclear layers and this is what uh, an OCT also shows us you know uh, OCTs in diabetic macular edema can show a variety of findings you know most commonly we see retinal thickening with increase in the central macular thickness there are interretinal cysts in the in the inner nuclear layer and outer nuclear layer and there's a subretinal fluid as well the uh, you know the relevance of these findings are they, they usually improve well with anti-VEGF anti therapy. And sometimes, uh, you know, in OCT, in diabetic macrodema, we can also see hyperreflective dots. We can see, uh, you know, uh, sometimes these dots can be exudates or it can be activated microglial cells in the, you know, migrating into the intraretinal space. And the relevance of this is they may, they may need prolonged anti-VEGF treatment. And even when the cystic spaces settle with, with the initial few anti-VEGF, when, when there are exudates, we have to keep continuing injections till they completely dry out. And the visual recovery can be potentially limited. And the other features that you see in diabetic macular edema, uh, you can also see you know, disorganization of the retinal inner layers called drill or the ellipsoid zone disruption. And the relevance of the drill is that there is worse baseline visual acuity because uh, it, it, uh, we don't see the, the fine separation of the layers in the inner retina. And the, uh, the ellipsoid zone depression, uh, disruption that's seen here uh, correlates to the final visual acuity after uh, successful treatment as well. So in OCT, uh, we, uh, with, with OCT, we can also use the thickness map to judge progression or response to treatment. Here is an illustrative case. 
you know, you can look at the thickness map on the side. They're very hot colors, red and white, and white's even more thicker than red. And you can see that the baseline visual acuity is 660 with significant swelling in the macula with the one anti-VEGF injection. And four weeks later, it's still 660 little. You can see that the th in the thickness map that the white spaces are getting smaller and smaller. And then with another injection, uh, eight weeks later, again, you can see that there is a slow uh, improvement in the swelling uh, of the macula and, uh, and, and so on as the anti-VEGF injections continue, you can see that there is still persistent swelling in the macula. So after six months of treatment, when we give uh, steroids, then we can we notice that, you know, within two months of uh, having an OZDEX injection, you can see that most of the swelling in the macula, the hotter colors like red and white have uh, have slowly disappeared. And now the, the there is the good hue of green in the central macula. And now the newer modality is OCT angiography, which is uh, which is uh, developing at a rapid pace, and more and more uh, developments are being made, uh, advances are being made. So, how does OCT angiography work? There are multiple B scans acquired at the same location to determine decorrelation, and uh, the, the anything that flows, like blood that flows in the vessels, uh, are shown up, you know, uh, because of the decorrelation calculation, and you can see the on fast image showing very fine capillary detail very nicely. What are the advantages of OCT angiography? Rapid image acquisition in less than about three seconds or so, safe and non-invasive. We don't need to use the dye because fluorescein angiography, as we all know, can have uh, you know, anaphylaxis and other reactions as well. And uh, th there are quite a few uh, manufacturers of OCT angiography machines like Zeiss, Optoview, Topcon, Heidelberg, to name a few. And uh, 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 the OCT angiography allows us unprecedented view of the capillary detail. This was very nicely shown in a study by, by Chandra and uh, Dong. You know, and here is the histology picture on the upper left and, and uh, the OCTA on the right, which actually shows capillary detail almost as close to histo histology. And below you can see that the fluorescein angiogram doesn't show capillary detail as much. And OCT allow, allows depth resolved imaging of the vasculature in the retina. This is the this is the FA on the on the on the left, and you can see you know fine uh, the history, you can see that the uh, the you know the fine vascular network on the superficial plexus and the deep plexus again showed by Chandra in his paper on IOVS in. 2010. So like I said, uh, fluorescein angiogram does not visualize the capillary, deep capillary networks. And here's the OCT angiography, you know, uh, here it shows nice, uh, the FAZ area with good foveal, so the circularity of the perifoveal vessels. And the OCT angiography allows us to look at the three, you know, uh, different vascular layers within the retina, the superficial plexus, the intermediate plexus, and the deep plexus. And it gives you uh, the information across these three uh, capillary networks. Here we go. Here's an OCT angiography. There's an illustrative case of a 53-year-old female uh, with type 2 diabetes for about 18 years. Vision is 624. And you can see uh, with the OCTA that there are there is widening of the FAZ and loss of perifoveal capillaries, which is commonly seen in uh, diabetic in diabetic macular edema. And this is a, to compare, this is an OCTA, which is in a normal subject uh, to compare it with the OCTA of a, of a diabetic. And it provides detailed evaluation of the macular circulation at the capillary level. And here you can see that the FAZ, the, the FAZ size varies. And is FAZ size correlated to the visual acuity? And Chandra in his paper in Ophthalmology 2016 showed that it is correlated with visual acuity in, uh, in diabetes. And sometimes the vascular information seen on OCTA is not the same as angiogram, as you can see in this picture. You know there are red, the red dots is the, are the microaneurysms that you can see on both uh, the OCTA and the FA. But uh, there are other, you know, hyperfluorescence that are picked up in the OCTA as well, which does not correlate there on on the FA that does not correlate on the OCTA. So in OCT angiography, there are you know with OCT angiography we could we can determine the FAZ area, which is a determinant of the visual acuity in diabetic maculopathy. You know, and we can, in, in OCT, with the OCT, we can look for 
you know, uh, the ellipsoid zone depression and other features like the drill length and FAZ area. When all the determinants of all, all the determinants of uh, visual acuity were studied, I think the most uh, the two that stood out were the FAZ area and the ellipsoid zone depression, which could prognosticate for visual acuity in these patients. And here you can see that the patient with reasonably good visual acuity, 2040, has a much smaller uh, FAZ, almost close to normal. But the patient B with the with you know vision of almost 660 has a much wider and irregular FAZ as mapped out by the OCT angiography. You know, and OCT angiography can also be used for precisely quantifying non-perfusion in the macula as well. And here are some volume rendered OCTA pictures done by Dr. Rick Spade in his paper in 2016 in Retina and in IOVS, uh, in Retina in 2015 and IOVS in 2016, where he, he showed uh, the, you know, the superficial plexus and the deep plexus. The superficial plexus is in blue and the deep plexus is in, uh, is in white. And the uh, cystoid spaces here are seen in cyan. But what he showed was that there was altered vascular morphology in these areas, mainly in the deep plexus. And even after the cystoid edema resolved, there was still some abnormal vascular morphology in these areas. So what happens here is the fluid is potentially removed from the retina by the molar cells in the, uh, from the deep capillary plexus. So OCTA shows reduced vessel density in the superficial and deep capillary plexus and vessel density changes in deep capillary plexus actually precede superficial capillary plexus changes. And like we showed uh, previously, increased FAZ area and disruption of circularity can help prognosticate for vision and help determine baseline you know, uh, ischemia as well. And there are other parameters like fractal dimension, which is like the, the, the branching pattern, and that is reduced as well. The, the FAZ area, the vessel density, and the fractal dimension predict the diabetic retinopathy progression, whilst the vessel density and the super, superficial capillary plexus predict di diabetes, uh, diabetic macular edema development. And coming to fluorescein angiography, you know, fluorescein angiography has been there for quite some time, initially described in 1959. Oh, sorry. And here is a normal fluorescein angiogram. And it, what does fluorescein angiogram do? It identifies uh, the areas of blood uh, retina barrier breakdown with, uh, with leakage and uh, blockage as well. And uh, when doing an angiogram, it is always uh, you know, prudent to keep, to keep an eye on the arm to retina circulation time because the dye should be visible in about 10 to 12 seconds when the dye is in, injected in the anticubital vein. Here is a uh, patient, a 64-year-old male with, you know, di diabetes for 22 years. Let me just see if I can play the video there. Yeah, let me just play the video and you can see that there's a delay in the arm retina circulation time and the dye appears in the retina at around only 25 or 26 seconds. So we're well into 28 seconds when this is happening. And, you know, and so significant delay in the arm to retina circulation may indicate internal carotid artery stenosis. So in, uh, in the diabetic angiogram, we can, uh, you know, the features that we should look out for are the widening or the irregularity of the FAZ suggestive of macular ischemia and areas of capillary non perfusion suggesting of retinal ischemia. And there, here are some proliferative complications in diabetic retinopathy. You can see lots of NBE, NBD, peripheral capillary non-perfusion and leakage. And uh, like described in textbooks, most of the, uh, the proliferation is seen at the junction of the perfused and non-perfused retina. And usually, even with diabetic macular edema, you can see that there is peripheral ischemia and the fluorescein angiography gives a measure of the VEGF load in the posterior segment. There is lots of non-perfusion and vessel staining in this picture, suggestive of a high vessel load. You know, and the previous studies showed that you know when when the when the eyes were injected, when animal models were injected with vascular endothelial growth factor, it produced profound retinal ischemia. 
And that is the basis of the anti-VEGF treatments that we have today. Here is a patient with a 48-year-old 48, uh, female with type 1 diabetic macular edema, again showing NVE with, with capillary non-perfusion. And the ultra-wide field angiogram shows lots of uh, vessel staining and leakage and capillary non-perfusion. You can see in this picture that once this patient was treated with, with the eight anti-VEGF injections, the fluorescein angiography takes a resemblance of normality with showing only very mild to moderate disease at this point in time with the re reduction of the capillary non-perfusion areas as well. You can see the difference between uh, these two images where there is significant improvement in the capillary non-perfusion areas. And here is the ultra wide field angiography, which is done with ATOS these days, uh, you know, which helps you look at the peripheral lesions, you know, and that can increase, that shows you an increased risk of diabetic retinopathy progression over four years as well. And the ischemic index here is the area of non perfusion by the total fundus area. And the greater ischemic index is associated with the recalcitrant uh, macular edema, as, as also shown in these papers. And uh, let me just, uh, in the interest of time, let me just show you a very quick case. You know, here's a 69-year-old male referred for uh, diabetic retinopathy with a right uh, hemorrhage. He's had, uh, as you can see on the optos, he's had previous panretinal photocoagulation laser. And uh, this is his other eye. And this is a standard 55-degree uh, angiogram. You can see some, uh, you know, hyperfluorescence uh, suggestive of NVE. But when you, when you put the patient on the ultra wide field, you can see significant capillary non perfusion of the peripheral uh, unlasered retina with vessel staining as well, suggestive of uh, high VEGF load in this eye. So uh, to just to summarize very quickly, we have, uh, uh, you know, not all these modalities put together uh, can help aid uh, and prognosticate uh, the clinical management of uh, diabetic retinopathy. You can see here we have the color fundus picture, which shows diabetic edema, uh, diabetic uh, retinopathy there with the angiogram of the same patient shows focal and diffuse macular edema. The, the OCT shows all these findings with outer and inner retinal cysts, subfoveal fluid, uh, hyperreflective foci, and disruption of the, uh, uh, the external limiting membrane and the ellipsoid with the increased thickness and the OCTA showing, you know, loss, uh, uh, widening of the FAZ. With, uh, with loss of perifoveal capillaries as well. So to conclude, you know, all these improvements in retinal imaging have facilitated better stratification and prognostication of diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema. And multimodal imaging has surpassed just standard color photography as well. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, uh, Vignesh. That was uh, that was very illuminating, so to say. <laughs> but uh, we'll, as I said, we'll come to uh, we'll come to the questions, and I think we'll have time for panel discussion uh, as we as we get along, unless we've got questions from the audience. So uh, I'd now like to invite Professor Chandra Balaratna Bala Singham, who's uh, a professor at the University of WA, the Lions Eye Institute, and also. Uh, is going to talk about also in Perth. We're going to talk about uh, the an update in the management of of a PDR. Or over to you, Chandra. All right. Thank you, Professor Verma, and thank you, Professor Sharma, for organising the session, and also my panelists as well. So I'll just open my talk. So I'm going to talk about proliferative retinopathy, which is something we all deal with as general ophthalmologists or retina specialists, uh, whatever that may be. Um, I'm really just going to pr provide an overview of the understanding of PDR. It's really just presenting both sides of the story in terms of, you know, our understanding of the disease and how, um, you know, we manage the disease and whether or not it has actually changed the treatment paradigms. So with respect to diabetes in general, um, we all know that the disease is something that's not going away. In fact, it's something that's certainly getting worse both, both in Australia and in Asia. And it's projected that over the next um, 20 years, we're going to be dealing with a much larger clinical burden of diabetic retinopathy related complications. And if we looked at the subsets of diabetes and type one diabetes, the risk of proliferation is nearly 40% over 14 years. Uh, whereas in type two, it's nearly 22% over 15 years. So there's a lot of uh, patients that are gonna require treatment in some form to preserve vision. 
I think our understanding of the natural course of diabetic retinopathy um, is limited, but this is one of the best papers I think we have in terms of sharing clinical data about the, the way diabetes progresses in the eye. <clears throat> this is a paper published nearly six years ago, looked at 65,000 patients in Germany and followed them over an extended period of time and just looked at the rates of development of proliferation, macular edema and so forth. <clears throat> and this, is, this graph really sums up the study very nicely, I think, because there's, um, you can see that the risk of proliferation is not linear. In fact, the risk of proliferation increases with time. Some people will never get proliferative retinopathy and in a lot of people after a certain point in their disease, their risk of developing proliferation is very high. Um, compare that to the patients that develop maculopathy where the curve is much flatter. So this again gives us um, evidence that the, uh, the pathways and the genetics behind developing diabetic macular edema and proliferative ret retinopathy may actually be quite distinct and different. Um, the risk factors for developing proliferation, uh, the risk is greater in type 1 diabetes. The longer you have diabetes, um, if it's poorly controlled, and also if you have great variability in the blood sugar levels. Um, systemic risk factors for proliferative retinopathy include uh, renal disease, hypertension, and also neuropathy, which is the new risk factor that has been shown to be very useful in prognosticating the risk of vision loss. So I'll just share a case with you. This is a patient of mine um, that I saw several years ago. She's young. She's had type 1 diabetes for 24 years. And when I saw her in 2017, she looked reasonably good. I thought she had moderate um, proliferative, non-proliferative retinopathy. Um, I reviewed her again um, annually, but two years later, this is what her fundus looked like. Um, you can see that she's had marked progression of the retinopathy, and now she's got retinal neovascularization and peripheral ischemia bilaterally, uh, despite being a vision of 6'6 in both eyes. So this is a subset of patients that I just want to draw attention to. So there is a subset of patients that are at risk of developing PDR, but there are also those patients that are at risk of developing rapid PDR. Rapid being that they um, have several stepwise progression of retinopathy uh, beyond what you'd expect. And these patients are those that have a severe change in their HbA1c, uh, whether it's an increase in HbA1c or a decrease. And the studies have shown that if you right, if the HbA1c goes from being eight to 10%, so there's a two point progression, then the risk of proliferation is actually increased by 30%. We're getting more and more evidence to tell us that patients that with renal disease are at really high risk of developing proliferative retinopathy. Um, and in fact, in this patient, that was the exact cause of her disease progression. Over the course of two years, she developed severe chronic renal failure and was on the verge of getting renal dialysis. So I think for her, that's what tipped her over the edge. Um, again, going back to neuropathy, that's an increasing risk factor for the development of rapid proliferative retinopathy. So patients that are otherwise well, and over the course of one or two years now have to develop peripheral neuropathy and foot ulcers, those patients probably should be watched more carefully. Um, and of course, pregnancy in uh, female of childbearing age should never be forgotten because that's the sort of a risk factor that we may forget about. If you talk about the pathogenesis of proliferation, if you looked at the literature, most of the evidence uh, or the concepts regarding proliferation come back to ischemia, hypoxia, and vascular endothelial growth factor. And I think this schematic diagram from the review paper in 2002 sums it up very nicely. You can see that there's a pathway of hyperglycemia uh, being the induction of a number of biochemical pathways, all of which end in the upregulation of vascular endothelial growth factor which will cause retinal neovascularization. Um, so let's take a look at that using a clinical case. So this is another patient of mine that developed proliferation over the course of one year. So this is the angiogram in 2018 before I was convinced they had proliferation. Um, and in 2019, they had obvious leakage on the angiogram. If you look at the site of retinal neovascularization very closely, uh, what you will see quite clearly is that there's been quite a lot of capillary non-perfusion surrounding the area of retinal neovascularization. So this certainly supports the concept that uh, ischemia and progression of capillary non-perfusion is a major risk factor for retinal neovascularization. If you take a little step back and look, just look at the histology of diabetic retinopathy, this is work done by one of my PhD students, Dong An, 
who has been studying the mechanisms underlying diabetic retinopathy for the last four years. This is a histology of the donor eye. So um, he's labeled it with antibodies for different things. And there's really three elements that I want uh, to pay attention to. A anything labeled in red is uh, highlighting vascular elements. So pericytes, endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells. <clears throat> Things that are false colored in blue are glial cells, mainly Muller cells and astrocytes. And anything in green are the neuronal elements. So bipolar cells, ganglion, emocrine, and horizontal cells. Um, really important to remember that these structures don't work in isolation. There is a very strong communication and interaction between these things. And this is what we refer to as the neurovascular unit. And that's often forget, uh, we forget about that in proliferative retinopathy very often. Um, but I think we're learning more about neurovascular units and neurodegeneration in diabetic retinopathy um, because there's more and more evidence since everyone is now using OCT, we're starting to see the manifestations of neurodegeneration in diabetes, um, something that happens very early in diabetic retinopathy, particularly in type 1 diabetes, is nerve fiber layer thinning. And we can capture that quite clearly on OCT. Uh, and we can see that often even before the earliest vascular changes such as microaneurysms uh, form. So neurodegeneration is a real concept that is occurring in diabetic retinopathy. It's, uh, there's probably several pathways causing neurodegeneration uh, and it's also modulating the course of vascular change also. Um, how do we treat uh, diabetic retinopathy uh, when it proliferates? Um, you know, the, the main way is PRP and this is a technique that was described 45 years ago. Um, this was the paper uh, presented by the Diabetic Retinopathy Study Research Group, and it showed very clearly that patients that had PRP um, did well long term. So this is a, a different patient, another type 1 diabetic who's 38 years old, presented with 6'6 vision to my practice for the first time after 21 years. And you can see that despite an acuity of 6'6, I mean, these changes were picked up by the optometrist. Um, they've got uh, fibrosis in the inferior periphery and the inferior uh, retina. And the angiogram shows severe um, ischemia peripherally and also nearly 360 degrees of circumferential neovascularization. So how did I treat this patient? Well, I treated them with PRP and uh, they did really well. So this is six or 12 months later, the neovascularization has regressed and their vision is still 6'6", and I'm confident that they're gonna be 6'6 for a long time. So PRP is a good treatment, but how does it work? We don't really know, it's the short answer. Uh, people have tried to study this, but we haven't re reconciled the mechanism. Um, one way to look at it is to go back to the histology of retina once you've applied laser to it. If you looked at this histology, this is from a paper published in 2013, this is in the human retina. You can see that areas where laser has been applied uh, the inner retina is largely preserved. Um, it's the outer retina that's disrupted. Remember, it's a thermal reaction between the RPE and the outer retina. And you do get loss of dysfunction of photoreceptors wherever you apply laser. Um, Professor Kringle and Professor Yu, they, they both work in Perth, Australia, and they've done research on uh, retinopathy for, for over 30 years. Um, to my knowledge, they're the only group that have tried to look at how oxygen uh, consumption changes in the retina after you apply laser. And they did some very elegant studies um, using animal models where they lasered the retina and then they took measurements using very fine micro pipettes um, running it through the retina. And what they actually found was that when sites where you applied laser, uh, the inner retina uh, oxygenation increased. So one mechanism by which PRP works is probably by reducing the oxygen consumption of photoreceptors because you have less of them after laser and increasing the oxygenation of the inner retina. Um, but I'm sure there are other mechanisms by which laser works. We just haven't worked it out yet. The other way that we can treat uh, prolifer proliferation as uh, uh, Dr. Raja just went through is we can apply anti-VEGF. Uh, anti-VEGF works by decreasing permeability of the circulation so you can treat macular edema but also it can inhibit angiogenesis, which is the pathologic growth of new vessels. If you start giving it in um, normalized, it, in, it, in, it inhibits vascular genesis and can cause all sorts of problems as well. Um, this is also some work Dr. Raja just described, but I'll go through it in a little bit more detail. This is probably one of the best studies, I think, which have linked vascular endothelial growth factor to the uh, progression of retinopathy and the induction of retinopathy in diabetes. So this is by the Boston group in the USA. And what they did was they injected VEGF into the vitreous in normal monkeys 
And they showed that the changes we were getting in the vasculature were very similar to what you would see in human diabetic retinopathy. Very nice paper. Uh, and we can prove that anti-VEGF works. So this is another patient of mine who presented with retinal neovascularization, you, which you can see on all three imaging modalities, um, treated with anti-VEGF. And, and I got them back to the clinic one week later, and you can see how quickly the anti-VEGF work. It causes neovascularization to regress very rapidly, and it's an excellent treatment for doing that. This is a different case. This is from Bailey Freud in the USA. Um, this is a patient that's had multiple anti-VEGF treatments for proliferative retinopathy. And look at how well the retina looks at the end of it all. Um, you could almost fool yourself into thinking that you're looking at a normal eye after two years of anti-VEGF treatment. So the retina looks really good. The bleeding's gone away. But probably the most important point I want um, us to take home from this talk probably is that anti-VEGF does not cure the problem of diabetic retinopathy. The fundamental problem that causes capillary non-perfusion and progression of uh, degeneration of the retina is uh, not cured by anti-VEGF. So I'll illustrate that with this case. This is a patient that I was treating with anti-VEGF for proliferation. And uh, the eye looked very good four, week, four months after four treatments. You can see that the staining of the vessels has reduced, there's less capillary leakage, the new vascularization in the infranasal retina has regressed. Um, we were all happy to stop the treatment, but this is the eye six months after stopping treatment. Um, you can see quite clearly that you're back to square, square one. You might as well have not given the four treatments to begin with. Um, the, the French group looked at uh, the effects of anti-VEGF on retinal uh, perfusion uh, in a really nice way. They looked at fluorescent angiography and OCT angiography before and after treatment with anti-VEGF. Um, this study in many ways confirmed what a lot of us suspected in that what anti-VEGF does is that it reduces the hemorrhages and it resolves neovascularization, but it actually doesn't restore non-perfusion. And you can see quite clearly on the OCT angiogram images in the lower panels that the OCTA areas of non-perfusion before and after therapy has not changed. I think the clinical evidence for anti-VEGF in um, proliferative retinopathy really comes down to protocol S by the DRCR net, and they compared PRP to anti-VEGF, and this is the five-year results, and they found that, you know, there was no difference between the two groups in terms of visual acuity. Um, there was more field loss with PRP, but surprisingly, anti-VEGF also resulted in PRP, in visual field changes in the periphery. Um, more patients in the PRP group required vitreoretin surgery for vitreous hemorrhage and tractional detachment, which I, to be honest, found very surprising. I would have expected the opposite result. Um, but this is the most important finding for me, was that after five years, nearly 40% of patients were lost to follow-up. So imagine um, treating patients with anti-VEGF um, and then not seeing them um, after several years. I mean, we all know uh, from the evidence that I've just shown you that the non-perfusion persists and in many people will progress. So these patients that have just had anti-VEGF without laser and at high risk of um, uh, you know, severe vision loss from vitreous hemorrhage and so forth. Probably one promise in terms of anti-VEGF therapy and proliferative disease is the port delivery system, which um, I'm sure most of you know about, um, which is something that's been investigated by Roche Pharmaceuticals, where they're using ranibizumab as a reservoir de depot system for slow release. It's been shown to be quite favorable in treatment of neovascular macular degeneration. Uh, but this is a system whereby we could possibly have slow release anti-VEGF for years, um, at, whilst at the same time reducing uh, the treatment load on the health system. So you can see in this, the, in this video, the port delivery system is, is being placed in the PARS planner, and it's simply going to be a matter of topping it up every six, 12 or 18 months with the relevant anti-VEGF agent. So in conclusion, um, just, you know, epidemiologically, we, we're going to have a huge treatment burden of PDR. Um, please remember that we cannot reverse PDR at this point in time. We don't have the technology or the expertise or the knowledge to do that. Um, PRP is an excellent treatment. It will guarantee long-term uh, good visual outcomes for most patients. So I still think it's at the standard of care and you know, anti-VEGF is effective and has, but has important limitations. And I really hope that I've shown you what those limitations are. The one thing I haven't spoken about uh, is the role of vitrectomy, which I've left to the next talk, 
uh, in the management of proliferative retinopathy. So thank you so much for your time and again, for the invitation to present at your meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chandra. And uh, I think we'll move on to the, the next talk, uh, which is going to be given by uh, Professor Sarvanan uh, from the Arvindai Hospital in Coimbatore on diabetic vitrectomy tricks and tips. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'd like to thank uh, Ransko as well as uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Vignesh for giving me this opportunity to be in, uh, participate in your session. So I'll be just highlighting a few uh, tips on how to ma surgically manage uh, uh, complications of uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So conventionally, when we see the indications for vitrectomy in diabetic retinopathy have been uh, non-resolving vitreous hemorrhage, uh, traction retinal detachment, either threatening or uh, involving the fovea, uh, combined mechanical retinal detachment, and uh, 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 progressive disease leading to uh, neoscular glaucoma. But in recent times, uh, this has expanded to uh, 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 doing surgery in patients who are not adequately responding to uh, uh, PRP laser. Uh, and people who have a vitreous macular traction, this has been picked up after the advent of OCT in our practice. And the presence of apparatal membrane, which can be sometimes a cause for uh, intractable diabetic macular edema. And even though tractional papillopathy is a, a sort of a controversial uh, uh, topic, uh, people have assured that uh, Operating uh, can relieve the traction and uh, release, uh, I mean, lead to resolution of the disc edema. So one more uh, recent uh, uh, indication which we normally do in our practice is uh, nasal traction, where you can see that the uh, uh, anatomy of the uh, macula is totally altered. Even though the fovea itself is surgical, I mean, is uh, attached uh, to the RPE, you can see that the pseudo disc edema of the overlying retina, the alter alteration in the architecture of the arcades and uh, the shortening of the uh, distance between the fovea and the disc margin. So if you look at the fovea itself, it shows it's totally normal, but when you look at the shortening of the distance, this can lead to slow onset vision loss, unlike a fovea involving a vitreal macular traction, this takes a long time for the vision to drop and operating date may not be able to recover the lost vision, so it's better to operate early. So first thing is like when you have a complicated case like this in your practice, always uh, it, uh, it, uh, the, the heart uh, comes to the mouth of how are we going to operate where we able to achieve a success, both functional as well as visual, visual outcome, outcome related. Will I be able to uh, take care of the intraoperative complication, especially bleeding and prevent retinal breaks from happening? So the first I feel is uh, it's all a mental game. Uh, so you have to be a little bit uh, at peace with your heart and uh, not get too much excited. And always try to have a plan on how we're going to navigate the various additions which are in place. You can make this plan when you're sitting in the clinic and looking at it through a sit lamp or indirect, or you can do on the table when you're getting a more, more clearer view with the line and the meter. You can make a plan on how to you go about, try to stick to this plan unless there's uh, some hurdle, significant hurdle, in, you may have to change your uh, direction of uh, plan of action. So again, uh, try to deal with these things as you would play a, uh, like a Mario Bros video game. Don't try to uh, initially visualize the final outcome, go in step by step like you would play a matter. Don't think of uh, saving the princess in the first uh, stage itself. You try to uh, visualize yourself only finishing the first stage, going to the next stage, uh, so on and so forth. So just try to uh, sort of uh, uh, face or uh, stage your uh, surgical procedures in uh, in the small, small uh, 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 stages so that you don't get, get uh, tired both mentally and physically. So there are two types of uh, going about this is one is reaching the membranes from outside in or uh, other ways uh, from inside out from the disc towards the periphery. I feel that the more uh, uh, complicated the membrane, it's better to go from outside in. If it's the simple membranes, you can uh, open the disc itself because it gets you the surgical pain immediately. It's good for simple membranes, but there's a little bit of higher risk of bleeding because you may rupture the major uh, neoscrub fronts at the center near the disc or at the disc itself. A lot of times, once the membrane becomes loose, you may need to go for a, 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 a bimodal technique. Outside in, I feel it's much more uh, easier to uh, operate in uh, complicated membranes. Only thing is, the, the getting the initial uh, uh, edge is a little bit uh, uh, difficult. This is uh, showing an uh, inside out technique in a very young patient who had a very significant uh, uh, membranes with no uh, posterior vitreous detachment. So I'm trying to make a nick. Usually, the, the, the membranes are too taut, and you may need to make a small rent with a sharp instrument. I usually use the 27 gauge bent needle to make the initial rent, and then this rent can be enlarged using your, either the 27 gauge uh, retractor or the 25 gauge retractor, which is ideal for uh, navigating this uh, scenario. And try to look at all the additions and try to make them into small, small islands, what you would call as a segmentation in the olden days. But here, we don't leave those segments, just trim it off as close as possible and address the bleeding also. You just go about uh, trying to make those into small, small islands and then trim it off. 
So again, as I said, don't try to usually the whole membrane be, be removed. Just finish off the superior quadrant, then the inferior, even temporal quadrant or inferior quadrant, and try to go face by face. So just trying to navigate as in uh, we go, we're trying to identify the uh, epicenters or addition, addition points and then isolating it and trimming it off. So in cases a little bit more complicated, as I said, you have to make this mental plan. And I, do, I usually plan for uh, operating from I am right-handed person. I try to uh, choose the superior temporal quadrant in the right eye and the infra, superior nasal quadrant in the left eye because that's how my hand is oriented. And going from top to bottom is much more convenient because your instruments are oriented that way. So the first step is always trying to uh, address the second membrane. This is the membrane just below the PVD. Once you cut the PVD and enter the sub uh, highlight space, uh, you have to use a sharp instrument to sort of uh, uh, get the second membrane out. This is very critical uh, to uh, uh, get a surgical success because if you're operating the plane beneath the PVD, you're going to get uh, difficult uh, 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 membrane peeling leading to multiple iatrogenic unintended breaks and also uncontrollable bleeding. So first step is always to identify the second membrane. Second membrane is just a small uh, uh, translucent or transparent membrane which is seen around the epicenters or where the nuances arise. And um, can be seen, in my, apart from my PDR, can be seen in other vascular disorders also. So I told you it's very transparent or translucent and edge is not always clear. Some people have used uh, various stains to identify, but it's not easy. So if you can look at the OCT, you can see that the enlarged picture can show the thin membrane running along the surface of the retina apart from the PVD, which is seen superiorly. So always expect that the second membrane is in place and then go about addressing it because if you're not in the correct plane, you're going to see. Sometimes the membranes are very tight like you see in this picture, or sometimes it's a little bit more looser in some of the cases. So depending upon how it is, you want to choose your instruments. And also you should keep in mind that sometimes the second membrane can run from arcade to arcades in some of the patients along the, um, across the macula. And leaving this without addressing it can lead to late onset epithelial membrane formation after three, four months uh, following surgery. So again, I was just a small video showing the importance. This is the PVD and the second membrane, which is running across the uh, surface of the retina onto the PVD. So if you're trying to work in the sub hyaloid plane, that's not the right plane, you're going to get a lot of complications. So always try to address the second membrane lift it up and then that is your sub second membrane plane is your ideal uh, uh, surgical plane because this can convert so-called plaque additions into multiple point additions that by making it much more easier to address. This is just showing a video when a loose addition, you can see just with the cutter itself, I'm able to elevate the second membrane and get into the surgical plane. So what looks like a big tabletop sort of a plaque becomes multiple uh, point additions. I can use my cutter delamination to feed the tissue into the, and use uh, slightly low suction and short bursts of cutting to address this membrane. So this case was a loose membrane where suction was enough to lift, but in cases like this where it is much more flatter and tougher and stronger addition, you may have to use the sharp instruments like I showed in the first case. I usually use the uh, 27 gauge bent needle, which the dental surgeons use for injecting uh, for gum anesthesia. So that is usually helpful in this. Just uh, once you lift that, you can see it's almost a transparent or membrane. And once you lift that, that's your surgical pain. Then you can switch to your forceps uh, uh, and go about feeding these uh, membranes much more, a uh, little bit easier and safer way, if we can uh, call that. So again, as I told you, sometimes you can see that the membranes are running from this uh, vertical scan showing the arcade to arcade involvement of the second membrane. Sometimes you forget that you do, you fail to recognize this on table and it can lead to late onset. I'm just showing a case where you can see now I'm, this is a PVD, there's a vitreum attraction of the small cyst there. So I was not able to see the membrane, but then I realized that uh, there's a very transparent second membrane there running from our inferior arcade to the superior arcade. So one night patient with a superior TRD with a vitreum macular cyst as well. So, so unless you identify this, uh, you're going to the risk of getting iatrogenic breaks also is quite high. In this, in this particular patient, you're able to get away without uh, uh, any tampon because we are able to avoid a hydrogenic break. You can see then uh, here I'm shifting to bimodal technique to address the superior membrane because it's very taut. But you can see that uh, as I remove it, you'll be able to see the two membranes. The whole, what I'm holding is the PVD and what is just a transparent floating membrane beneath that is the uh, second membrane. So you should always make sure that you identify that correctly because it is critical to make your surgery much more easy as well as less complicated. So when you're in the right plane, what looks like a sort of so-called plug will become, will become into multiple points here. What looks like a tabletop plug at the superior mm -hmm. arcade is converted to a, uh, multiple points as you go in the, you can see there's a, the flow of the uh, membrane across there. And you can see this now it's four points there. 
once it is trimmed, it is just four points rather than a plug. So if you're on the right plane, true plugs do exist, but it's less common. So what looks like plugs are usually multiple closely uh, placed point additions. So when you're dealing with disc membranes, you also remember that it's uh, important to address the second membrane here as well. So if there's a large membrane, usually when you, when you reach the second membrane plane, it, is, uh, it leads to disc normally. But in cases where only there's a large uh, uh, fibrosclerosis proliferation on the disc, you have to correctly uh, go about putting this. Otherwise, the chance of creating peripapillary tears or rupturing the major uh, vessels at this juncture can be catastrophic, especially if you're rupturing an artery, it's going to be catastrophic and that can be the end of surgery. So being the right plane, there's a very, very less risk of uh, rupturing either the retina or the major vessels at this uh, critical point. I'm just showing one more case here where the second membrane was almost uh, not uh, visible. So I had finished all the membranes and I was trying to address it. It was a little bit difficult, but then I realized there was a small membrane running across the disc. So I'm just elevating with my 27 gauge needle there. And uh, so once you identify that, then it's uh, once you feel that what was uh, tenacious looking uh, uh, nasal uh, fibrous uh, proliferation was easy to remove. That's you can see that now it's coming off. It was a second membrane there. And what looked a little bit tenacious trying to work around this was not uh, coming off easily. But then once I went into the subset, second membrane plane, you can see it's coming off without much of an issue there. So uh, again, uh, during the olden era, the various techniques were described by especially Steve Charles gave all these names. Segmentation where you just leave off large bits by dividing them and bisecting them into small, small uh, uh, pieces. Delamination is where you try to use scissors to uh, divide the additions. And end block, where you cut the bit, uh, major part of the case after releasing all the additions. In MIVS, again, we have different names, conformal delamination, fold back delamination, and lawnmower technique. All are just various fancy names for the routine technique. End block in the olden days was just releasing the addition first using especially the horizontal scissors and then releasing that and then finally removing the vitreous. That's what, how it was described in the olden days. And segmentation is not usually followed because of the very poor outcomes. We just divide the membranes and leave it there to avoid retinotomy, but it's not a good technique nowadays. Conformal delamination is where your cutter is facing the membrane and you can trim very close. So the risk is that in a tenacious membrane or thin mobile retina, you can eat the retina also. So that's why you have to be a little bit care, care, take care about. So, uh, so also whenever you feel that uh, nowadays we see that the use, after the advent of uh, micro instantectomy system, the use of scissors and forces will really come down. So scissors is a very important role to play, especially in chronic arteries where the retina is very thin and the additions are more severe. So scissors gives you a much more safer way to release all these additions compared to cutter. So cutter delamination is, is easy and uh, much more simpler only if you uh, employ it in uh, uh, less stiff membranes and uh, uh, nice uh, thick retinas, not mobile. So in mobile retina and thin retina, this is also gives you a uh, very neat and uh, uh, surgical uh, uh, separation of the tissues. So when you're doing a cutter delamination, always cut in short bursts, especially in a mobile retina, feed the tissue into the mouth and give short bursts so that you don't accidentally eat up the retina. You know, this helps in preventing nitrogenic retinal injury, especially when you're dealing with the thin and mobile retinas. So again, showing a small video on how a conformal delamination is done. Just feed that up and then give short bursts. This is a combined mechanism already, as you can see. So don't cut in full force, just give short bursts so that you have a lesser risk of injuring the retina, especially near the macular zone. Fold back can be employed as an initial stage to identify the surgical pain. Just the, here, the cutter is facing the opposite to the retina. It gives you a little bit uh, a view of what is underneath. You can see the here the fold back gets what's happening. The membrane is falling back into the cutter. It gives you a little bit better view of what is underneath, so you can go about planning your. It's a sort of intermediate test technique before you go ahead and address the membranes in a proper way. So the peeling disc membrane sometimes if you're on the correct plane, it's much more easier to show you. So what you see here is uh, sometimes uh, during this peeling technique, you can have a disc bleed. So when you have a disc bleed, sometimes people get upset or what's going to happen here. Uh, so as I told you, uh, when you're trying to peel the membranes on the disc, usually in a chronic TRDs, we have a crater-like uh, uh, cavity there. So trying to address the membranes in the anterior posterior direction can create uh, hydrogenic uh, uh, breaks. So you go about uh, peeling them in a more tangential way. So you have to hold it in the deep crater, uh, part of the crater, and then slowly pull it across on that more tangential way rather than anteroposterior because that can create a lot of traction and create hypogenic cells. So hold it in the central area and then try to peel it in a more tangential force rather than a uh, vertical force. The 
I'm just showing a case of disc bleeding. Whenever I disc bleeding, sometimes people get very excited, especially the junior doctors. So always make a call on what is bleeding, whether it's a ruptured NBD, a ruptured venule, or a ruptured arteriole. Arteriole is one of the drastic complications and very difficult to control. Usually what bleeds is the ruptured neovascular membrane of the disc that can be controlled by raising the bottle height. In case it is not stopping, uh, with the, even with full bottle height, you can use a little bit of pressure with a blunt instrument sometimes, the soft tip cannula or with the cutter itself. We used to have some uh, ball-shaped device for this, uh, retina massager, but it's not available with the MIVS. It will help you to stop the bleeding in case of uh, bleeding, which does not get controlled with the pricing of the bottle height. Then you have the visco dissection, which is a learning technique. You can use the uh, uh, visco stain with the BBG to uh, do healing across the macula, a little bit safer, but it's not a great technique. And also, bimal technique, as I already showed you, it's very helpful to deal with very tenacious membranes and uh, pad retina is very thin. So, so if you do it everything in the correct way, you'll be able to uh, get a very happy outcome. And I think I'll stop the uh, PPT here. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, you make it look so simple. I'm almost tempted to try it myself. I'm not a surgical retinal surgeon, but uh, no, very well done. And uh, I'd now like uh, to request my... Uh, my colleagues uh, Chandra, uh, Hesam, and Vignesh to reveal themselves. <laughs> and uh, really, uh, I've just been, uh, you know, from, from the point of view of general ophthalmologists, I believe that, uh, that sessions like this do help uh, general ophthalmologists to, uh, to position themselves because they're the ones who see the bulk of the patients and then refer them on to, uh, to uh, subspecialists or to uh, or to people who are specialized in in this. So, from a from a very uh, sort of basic point of view, from a, from a first presentation point of view, we uh, we might start backwards, and uh, I might put to the panel, uh, what would you do when uh, if a patient present who's had previous panretinal photocoagulation, and then comes in with a vitreous hemorrhage, uh, and then you look at the uh, look at the the fundus photograph or, uh, and then you see that you can't do any more laser. I mean, you know, you've sort of, you sort of done as much as you physically can, uh, but the patient still presents with intermediate or, you know, bleeds now and then, uh, which uh, then sets them back for a few weeks. Uh, so what would your approach to that be? I mean, we see that quite commonly. So I might, I might ask, uh, uh, Sarvanan, what, what is your approach to once you finish PRP, and then the PDR is still active. I think when you, when you have a vitreous hemorrhage, there are two reasons for a bleed. One is when there's an actively growing neusal, which uh, tends to break and bleed. And second is where there's a partially uh, regressed neusal, where there is some traction going on, which uh, tends to pull on the partially uh, resolved uh, regressed vessel, which leads to these uh, uh, recurrent bleeds. Usually in the second scenario, the amount of blood is a little bit lesser. And the first scenario, the amount of bleed usually is more severe. So when you when you have a, you have to make a call on what exactly is the cause for this, whether it's a, a very progressive disease in spite of doing copper laser or just a small attraction element which is causing a small small amount of bleeds. The second scenario usually the observation is the choice, and uh, you can wait and watch in these cases, and it will be resolved by itself. So if there's the first case scenario, or when the second case where there's multiple frequent bouts where the patient is very uh, mm -hmm. dis in much too much discomfort because of recurrent recurrent bleeds, I usually prefer to go for a uh, uh, vitrectomy surgery because it's more definitive. But in case the patient is not ready or for some other reason, then we can try anti vitreous injections also. But my choice is, uh, especially in, like India, in a country like India, where multiple injections is going to uh, uh, put a significant load because two injections of lucentis is equal to a surgical cost. So doing a surgery uh, is equal to giving two injections of lucentis. And it's much more, if you look at the long run, it's much more uh, uh, cheaper for the patients and more gives you a much more permanent outcome. So I look at the amount of bleed, the cost for the vets, active vessel or a partly aggressive vessel, and the discomfort of the patient himself. All this will make me decide whether to go for surgery or for observation. Thank you, thank you. We might just go around the panel and see if there are any any differing views. Uh, uh, Chandra, what would you do? Oh, look, I, I would do that to a large extent. I think the other thing we need to think about is why they're still proliferating when, you know, if you've given them a full PRP, you've indented them and you've lasered them out to the aura. So I have a very low threshold for doing carotid Doppler ultrasound just to make sure they don't have carotid stenosis. You know, if these patients are smokers, then the risk is much higher. Um, you know, then you have to go back to the basics about um, 
you know, mm-hmm. how good is their blood sugar control, the HbA1c, their renal function, and so forth. And I completely agree. If there's a, if it's a PVD related issue that's causing recurrent hemorrhages, I think that you know the best thing for the patient is just to say, look, we, with surgery, there's a good chance we can cure this, um, and you can just move on with your life. Uh, you can give anti-VEGF, and that's reasonable. The thing with that is they'll have recurrent hemorrhages as the PVD evolves. And because in diabetes, they all have anomalous attachments that may take years for the vitreous to completely separate. And during that time, you're just left with a scenario where they keep coming in with hemorrhages and they can't work. Um, so, I mean, my approach is very similar to what um, was just discussed, but there's just a few nuances I'd think about as well. Yep. Uh, has some any, any addition to this approach or do you do things differently? given that you're dealing with patients who are often two hours or three hours away uh, from you? The only thing I'd add, uh, Nitin, is, um, you know, I'm I'm a medical retina person, not a VR person. So if I think they need a vitrectomy, I'm referring that on after a V-scan. But the the other thing that I find not uncommonly is PRP is often done without a block um, in WA. And as a result, I find I always do PRP with a block. And I'll tell the registrar to do that as well. And I find I just get on more laser. Um, often I'm getting on 400 shots extra, 500 shots extra, and able to get to the very far periphery. Once you've got a block in, it's so comfortable to do PRP. You can pretty much just put your foot down and get some extra laser on. So yes, sometimes the laser is full, but often you can get a little bit more on and you can temporize with anti-VEGF as well. Good. Vignesh? Uh... You know, I think uh, Nitin, I think uh, you know Professor Sarvanan and uh, Chandra Nisam have covered all the points. You know the only time that uh, you know they continue to bleed is is if uh, if the new vessels are too close to the arcade and you know and and with the laser we can't go very close. You know uh, because we because sometimes if you go with laser too close to the NV it causes more traction. So I've seen patients with uh, very good PRP, but still continue to bleed, and usually vitreous is the culprit, or, or you know, uh, and of course the underlying, uh, you know, uh, comorbidities and poor glycemic control and carotid disease. So it's yeah. the same. Uh, thank you. I think that clarifies it, and uh, there seems to be a reasonably a close consensus on this, uh, regardless of geographical uh, positioning. Uh, what about a patient where you've done a, a done done the PRP and you do a fluorescein angiogram to check whether you complete or not, and you look at it and say, "God, where do I do more PRP?" Because you still got these little fluffy bits around that are still still there. Now, what's your protocol when you see persistent uh, NVE? Uh, it's usually the NVE rather than the NVD that you generally get to see in situations like this. But how do you how do you manage such a patient in terms of follow up? Uh, we might start with you, Vignesh. We go the other way now. Yeah. So, uh, say patients who've had good PRP and still have persistent NVE, I think if uh, you know, like if their diabetic disease has been stable, the carotids are normal, uh, not a smoker, you know, and they're they're managing pretty well. If they have reasonably good visual acuity, then I just add, uh, you know, and there is no more space for any more laser, then. Uh, when, then uh, what I just do is if they don't have any vitreous hemorrhage, they have reasonable visual acuity, I just monitor, you know, uh, very closely with, uh, you know, with Optos ultrawide field imaging and make sure that, it, uh, you know, we just keep monitoring them if their vision is reasonably good. But uh, here, of course, the vitreous will be the culprit, you know, uh, if, uh, you know, as and when uh, the NVE progresses and then there is vitreous uh, schesis and vitreous traction on it, they will eventually bleed. Eventually, they will eventuate to vitrectomy one fine day. And uh, when they are in, when they undergo vitrectomy, usually we give them about we give them an evastin two or three days earlier, you know, uh, and not not any longer to prevent the crunch. And then when we do the vitrectomy, we can actually burn off this NVE with long pulse duration laser as well at the same time. Right, uh, Hasem, uh, what would you do? Observe. But yeah, look, um, Prof, I've got a number of patients who I've seen where you've got, you can see a visible new vessel, whether it's at the disc or elsewhere, and it just sits there, does nothing. Yep. So there's a proportion of patients where it does nothing. Then there's a proportion when that vessel eventually bleeds on you, completely full PRP. I've got some patients who I'm giving anti-VEGF 
let's say once every three months, four months, five months, or even six months, I'm titrating the anti-VEGF to how frequently, let's say, they've had the vitreous hemorrhage. So you may get away with two injections a year in someone who's got full PRP and prevent vitreous hemorrhage that way. Yeah, Chandra? Yeah, I agree with what uh, Vignesh and Hassan have said. I think um, I have some patients similar to Hassan where I think I'll give anti-VEGF every three or four months just to hold things together. These are patients, though, that have had, you know, these tiny little vitreous hemorrhages time, from time to time, which are annoying enough to stop them from working. So it's really just to make that regression happen and stop the hemorrhage. I always tell these patients that there's a chance that they're going to have a catastrophic vitreous hemorrhage and they're going to go to hand movements vision. But if that was to happen, then the surgery is actually very straightforward if they've had a good PRP um, yeah. and it's a very predictable outcome. So, you know, I do reassure them in that way. But I think just, you know, one thing I have a real interest in is the disease pathways and proliferate PDR. And, you know, we have these patients that do proliferate even with full PRP. And that's obviously telling us that there's other pathways which have nothing to do with perfusion which causes the diseases to progress. I mean, we just don't know what it is yet. So, you know, more research is needed. And Saranan, anything? Uh, more or less uh, what was already discussed. Uh, in case, where I, it is proven that the FFA is showing that there are a lot of, a lot of skipped areas in the periphery, I would uh, first give injections to stop them I and make the bleeding stop and then go ahead with trying to fill up all these zones in the periphery. Also, if there are any skipped areas, I would like to do a fill-in PRP in these zones also. In spite of this, if it's still bleeding, then obviously uh, surgery will give you a good result. Okay. Well, we might just then jump to jump to the imaging. Uh, at many conferences, there's always this sort of uh, talk about, uh, you know, is fluorescein angiogram or fluorescein angiography still necessary in our, in the old days? We we did the fluorescein angiogram much more often than we do it now. Uh, uh, but uh, you've got a patient who has, let's say, had had diabetes for 10 or 12 years, um, everything everything looks normal, then you see them uh, after a year or two, changes start. Uh, wh when would you like to do a fluorescein angiogram or do you do it when you see the patient first time for everybody? Where does the fluorescein angiogram fit in given that you've got OCTA, you've got wide field OCTA, you've got all these fancy gadgets that, uh, that, that are there now? Uh, is the poor uh, fluorescein angiogram going to be redundant? Or do you think that it still has a future? Uh, Sarvanan, what do you think? Yeah, no way, no way. Uh, FFA is uh, here to stay. Uh, all these uh, <laughs> thing is, uh, at least in our population, where uh, we have a lot of uh, people who do go in for cataract surgery quite late. So even a little yeah. bit of lenticular opacity is going to cause a significant drop in the quality of the uh, OCT angiogram picture, especially when you're trying to deal with the peripheral uh, zones, which is very critical for a, uh, for a patient with the diabetes retinopathy, not like a CNVM value, just dealing with the fovea and the macula. So in diabetic retinopathy, you want to look, have a look at the periphery, which is not the best way to do with the OCT, definitely, at least not in a population like India, where there is significant case with the uh, peripheral lens opacities, no way. Hassan, what, what's, your, uh, what's your take on this? Oh, I love fluorescein angiography. I think it's so useful. <laughs> you get so much information from it. And uh, so, for example, you know, think about, let's say you've got a severe NPDR patient. First of all, you can really be confident that they definitely don't have a little flat new vessel somewhere that you missed. Yep. And then secondly, if it's a poorly controlled diabetic, occasionally, not often, but occasionally, I will laser, I'll do targeted laser to someone with severe NPDR who's got pretty widespread peripheral non-perfusion if I think that they're a poorly controlled diabetic and they're going to do poorly. So in settings, in examples like that, fluorescein angiography is super useful, I think. Chandra, yours? Uh... Yeah, look, I completely agree with all of that. I think fluorescein is here to stay. You know, the things that we use to decide treatment is neovascularization, non-perfusion and leakage. And you often won't get that information with OCTA. And with OCTA, you'll uh, miss early signs of diabetic retinopathy like microaneurysms. So I do a lot of angiography too, fluorescein based. And um, yeah, I, I think it's invaluable. I think OCTA at this point in time is more of a research tool in diabetic vascular disease than anything else. Very good. Yeah, no, it's important to put it in perspective because quite often, you know, that old feeling when you go to a Congress and you come back saying, my God, I do nothing. Everybody's doing everything else. You know, I don't have it. Yeah. yeah. Vignesh, what's your thoughts on this? 
No, I would say, uh, you know, I would agree with the, with the comments of the panel because, you know, I think uh, fluorescein and geography is irreplaceable. You know, I think mild, mild to moderate disease, we don't do it, uh, I don't do it, but if I see any diabetic macular edema or severe disease or documented progression, then uh, fluorescein and geography is my go-to. And, uh, you know, to combine it with both the 55 degree and the Optos ultra wide field, you know, because uh, often you find that patients with the, you know, with the stubborn diabetic macular edema have a fair degree of, uh, you know, capillary non-perfusion or, you know, a, a bit of, uh, or, uh, or vascular staining and, uh, you know, uh, ischemic areas in the periphery. And, uh, you know, and like, and then uh, we can actually target the capillary non-perfusion areas very nicely when doing, uh, uh, you know, laser and not ablate the healthy retina. So I think it's here to stay and is a very important tool in the management. Right. No, that's, uh, that, that's good. No, we, we always talk about treating the whole patient rather than just treating the eye. And uh, of course, the issues of, uh, you know, uh, smoking, of, uh, of adequate blood, blood sugar control, blood pressure control, lipid control, uh, and, and all these things uh, are, are important, but they often are the stumbling block in, in, you know, people think I've had my laser, I've had my injection, now I'm invincible. Uh, but uh, you've obviously seen patients who had uh, pancreatic transplants and then they come and say, well, now I don't take any diabetic uh, medication anymore uh, and everything is okay. Now, what would you do? Would you continue to follow up these patients? Because that's becoming more and more common. Uh, would you consider, would you con continue to follow up these patients? If yes, how often? Uh, and uh, now that the, the triggers are gone, at least the, the standard triggers are gone, what are your thoughts on, on, uh, on looking after these patients in the long term? Uh, Bala, your, uh, Chandra, your, 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 you, you must deal with a lot of these people. Yeah, I've got a few of these patients. You know, typically they do really well once they've had the transplant. Um, you know, I find that the rate of progression of the retinopathy really slows down. Um, having said that, I still screen them. Uh, you know, I still review them every year if they need it, if they have retinopathy. A lot of these patients have already had PRP, so they've already been stabilised in that respect. Um, but, uh, no, it's remarkable how well they do in terms of the eyes once they've had the transplant, actually. It's quite amazing. Yeah, Vignesh? Uh... Yeah, no, in fact, uh, you know, people with the pancreatic transplant or uh, gastric bypass these days, which is the fad, you know, they lose 20, uh, you know, 20 kilos and suddenly they're better. But then the thing is, uh, like Chandra showed in his talk as well, that, you know, sudden lowering of, uh, you know, of blood sugar can also have, you know, some, uh, some implications. Uh, but usually these people, uh, you know, they do pretty well. Uh, and uh, because most of them have had laser, but maybe uh, I wouldn't, you know, I would still continue to monitor them. But if if I see if I see that the disease is stable and they're doing pretty well, then I drag out the interval between uh, monitoring. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, Hesam, any anything to add? No, 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 not not much to add. Yeah, bariatric surgery, surgery, and gastric sleeve surgery is what I see the most commonly. And, and these guys either become normal glyce no, normal glycemic or they improve a lot. So A, yeah. there's a paradoxical worsening, which you've got to look out for, and B, it's case by case. So often it, it, it'll get extended out. We have, so, a uh, we have a transplant center within one kilometer of a hospital. They do a, a few transplants. But I've, I'm surprised to see that these cases, uh, sort of the disease sort of becomes very quiet once their systemic status becomes normal. And uh, I think probably we can decrease, uh, I mean, at least increase the duration of uh, between follow-ups in these particular patients where you know that they are doing quite well. I'm, I'm, I've been surprised by some of the results in a few patients of uh, people who have undergone transplant. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. Uh, any other comments from the panel? I think otherwise we'll vacate our this thing and I can see uh, a lot of known faces coming up on the screen who are going to possibly be the next uh, this thing. So. Uh, it's it's great. Hello, Maipal. Hi, Nitin. How are you? Good, good. So uh, I think if there are no questions, well, from uh, from from us, the uh, uh, you know we just finished a, a session on uh, diabetic retinopathy and diabetic eye disease and imaging and all sorts of things. You guys are obviously doing something in the interior segment. So, but uh, it's great seeing all of you, uh, and I hope 
you all stay well and have, uh, we've got a little bit of Congress left and that's successful too. So thank you and we'll sign off. And I'd like to thank uh, my panelists and uh, also AIOS, uh, all the best. Thank, thank you. you so much, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Bye.